Numbers 14. We're not going to read the whole text, but we'll start with a few verses here in Numbers 14, beginning in verse 26 down through verse 39. <clears throat> As you're turning there, maybe we should just have a review because the last week when we were in the book of Numbers, is this on? Okay, there we go. It is. We were in the book of Numbers and uh, we learned some important lessons but we were all in a food coma, so I'm not entirely sure anybody remembers what we covered last week. But you've got judgment ready to fall in the middle of chapter 14, and God's ready to deliver judgment, and they deserved it, let's be honest. I mean, they earned the, the, the baseline of justice demanded they be wiped out and God start over. That was the baseline after the way they blasphemed God and said, we don't want to go, it was, it was worse than we don't want to go into the promised land. It was, we want to stone anyone who would suggest that we trust God. It was better for us back in Egypt. I mean, they're not thinking. They're not thinking. So God has to bring judgment. He says, how long must I deal with these people? And then Moses intervened. And we made, the, we made the observation last week that some men find mercy and others find judgment. And while both responses are just and righteous, one is definitely preferred above the other. So what makes the difference? <clears throat> How does, does one who deserve justice or judgment, I should say, find mercy? And the answer is what? Do you remember? Faith. If you remember in the food coma, that was faith. Because Moses placed his faith in what God said about himself. Now, he was kind of panicking, and he threw, he threw a couple of things out there, hoping they would stick. Like, aren't you going to be uh, embarrassed in front of all the pagan nations of the world who think you can't do the job? To which God didn't even respond. I, that's not... Does not bother me. But then Moses said, Lord, you said that you offer mercy to thousands. And it's not like God changed or Moses changed God's mind because God already intended to give mercy. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said to Moses anything. He just would have boop, and that would have been that. But he intends to give mercy if we can appeal to him in faith. And that's exactly what Moses did. And Moses said, Lord, I have faith. This is what he had faith in. That you are who you said you were. And that your mercy is as generous as you said it would be. Would you then give your mercy? And he says, I will. But judgment still must come. Judgment still must fall. And so we find, as we concluded last week, our faith fills the earth with God's glory and our faithlessness masks the glory of God Thus, it is only just that God's mercy and judgment would be according to your faith. And that is what we find out. Now, verse 26, here's what the Bible says. And the Lord spake unto Moses and <clears throat> unto Aaron, saying, Here it is again. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings. I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as he has spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Uh, notice what they just said. I mean, it was our conclusion that we came to. According to their faith, be it unto you. Remember that, what Jesus said in the New Testament? It's true here. He said, exactly as they said, it will be done unto them. Verse 29, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless ye shall come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein. Save, I'm sorry, ye shall not come into the land. I read that wrong. Concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, which he said <clears throat> should be a prey, then will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, 
They shall fall in this wilderness, just as they said would happen. That was their fear. Better for us to die in the wilderness. That, that's what they said. Uh, God said, okay, that's what will happen. Oh, man, painful. It's smart, as some might say, right? That hurts. <clears throat> Verse 33, and your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms. Like, what does that have to do with what happened? Whoredoms is unfaithfulness. That's, that's the expression there. And you know what they had been to God? Unfaithful. They're going to bear their whoredoms in the wilderness for 40 years <clears throat> until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness after the number of days in which ye searched the land, even 40 days each day, for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Man, and I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall, con uh, they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search out the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up e uh, th the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, went to, uh, that went to search the land, lived still. And Moses <clears throat> told this saying, I'm sorry, and Moses told these sayings unto the children of Israel, and all the people mourned greatly. We're going to make it to the end of the chapter, but that's a good place to stop for now as we study this lesson. Without me, ye can do nothing. Without me, ye can do nothing. Taken from John 15. Without me, ye can do nothing. Heavenly Father, I pray we'd learn from these truths. Lord, they've, they've already made some mistakes and, and, and you've pronounced some judgment upon them, but they're about to make an even worse mistake in their presumption. I pray that we would recognize it for what it is. We'd learn from their mistakes and not make the same mistakes and live by the principle that we can do nothing without you. Speak through your word. Encourage your people in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. No one gets through the wilderness by sight. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the wilderness. We'd call it something else. But to move through the wilderness to their desired haven, or in our case, whatever our wilderness may be, to move through the wilderness of life requires us to walk by faith and not by sight. And that's the lesson. That's what Numbers is all about. <laughs> and it's summed up in this cool little song you may have heard before. <laughs> My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. That's it. That really sums up life fairly well. There are wilderness times that are hard to navigate. Here's what God expects of his people. The just shall live by faith. Here's what God expects of his people. Expect that God knows the way and you need to follow him. That's what it will take. Well, <clears throat> human nature is such that we're more inclined to walk by sight and not by faith. And when they finally made it to the promised land, the people simply refused to believe that the Lord who has brought them thus far will be their de a deliverer now in spite of all the evidence. I mean, it's... Uh, you, you can't rehearse the story without being a little overwhelmed at their thinking. Like, it'd be one thing if God came to you, such as the widow of Zarephath. That story haunts me because I, I'm, I'm the preacher. Like, I can't even contemplate. Can you, AJ? Going to a widow, and before any miracle is performed, you say, she says, this is the last meal my son and I are going to eat, and then we die. And then you say, okay, feed me first. I mean, like, ugh, it's hard to even say those words because she didn't see anything. Now, that's one thing. The children of Israel saw everything. 
It's not like they show up on the scene like, who is this God who says that we can trust him? He sent 10 plagues on Egypt. He conquered the greatest nation on earth. He parted the Red Sea. He fed them with manna from heaven and quail when they wanted meat. He gave them water. He, out of a rock, he turned bitter water to sweet. He led them by a pillar of cloud in a day. I mean, like, every, and then there, it's not like they, they weren't acquainted with God's judgment. They decided to make a golden calf. Like, this will work for God. We're from, it, it's, it, oh, look at you. Larry, you're so kind. Thank you. Oh, yeah. No, the message just got longer and everybody loves Larry for it. <clears throat> no, I'm just... <laughs> you increased my stamina. Uh, no, but they've seen all this. They've, they've seen all this. It's not like they're going into this blindly. They know the blessings of God. They know the judgment of God. People died by the masses when they turned their back against God. So how they got here and thought, yeah, he can't... God's not going to take us the rest of the way. I, I, it's hard to wrap my mind around it. But as I said, it gets worse than that because their response was almost unbelievable at the end of the day. They're like, let's stone them. Let's just stone them, get us a new leader, and head back. <clears throat> but the faith of their leader spared them from certain death. And yet, judgment still must come. Do you remember the, the title of the message last week? It was listed wrong on, on YouTube, but it was close. The title of the message last week was this, The Determining Power of Faith. Faith determines everything. Everything. The deter faith determines the outcome of everything. <clears throat> we must walk by faith. And so, we see this truth played out. We just read in verse 28, God says this, saying to them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Out of their own mouths, God passed judgment. Isn't that the worst? <laughs> Isn't that the worst? Some of God's greatest judgment is to let people have what their faith believes. Oh, that's scary. But God gave them exactly what they had asked for. Why? Well, because only those who pursue His will can enjoy His gifts. And the gift of the promised land were only for those willing to follow Him by faith. They weren't going to get it. Now, that should have been settled. They should, I, they should have wept. I would have wept too. And there's nothing wrong with that. They should have wept. They should have mourned. They should have repented. All of that's kosher. All of that's okay. But God said in verse 25, the next day, you get up and you head back. Not like all the way back to Egypt, but back in the way towards the Red Sea, back in the wilderness, you're going to be there for 40 years. You know what they should have done? They should have said, I, I really don't want to do that, and it's really painful, but I would rather not argue with God when he's got the rod in his hand. I don't know if that's ever happened in your house. Certainly did growing up. There was this, there was this, there was this, uh, it was the Rubicon, you know, the point of no return in dealing with dad. When it was punishment time, you didn't go into the bedroom and come out unscathed. That was guaranteed. But what wasn't guaranteed is if you argued with him, how many additional you might get if you didn't listen. It's just the way it was. It was already determined. It was predetermined. You're in trouble. They should have just said, all right, let me take it. Because you know what the hardest thing to do in correcting your kids or in God correcting anybody? You know what the hardest thing to do is? You know what the hardest thing? Every kid ought to be taking notes. If you don't take notes, you ought to take notes right now. The hardest thing to do is when they hug you as tightly as they can. You know what I'm saying? Because like doing this kind of thing, it's just like, oh, because you can sense, all right, I know I did wrong. Please forgive me. You see what I'm saying? Now, I got to say, even in my house, there's a certain level of punishment that needs to be meted out when things have been done wrong. But it sure does get reduced when there's genuine repentance. 
That would have been understandable. That's not what happened. <clears throat> the next day comes around after their great failure, and the Jews are supposed to start on their long march home, or back through the wilderness, I should say, and they were being judged. Listen, they were being judged for their lack of faith in God's blessings, the promised land. Now, in astonishing irony, they lacked faith in God's judgment. First, they lacked faith in God's blessings. Now God says, I'm going to judge you. And they, I don't know if they don't believe him. I don't know if they think they can get out of it. But now they're not showing faith in God's blessings. They're not taking him at his word. <clears throat> I love what one commentator said. He said, unbelief, a spirit of complaining, and a rebellious attitude are terrible masters that cause no end of trouble in the lives of those who cultivate them. I would agree. I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> they're not responding the way, the way they should. They're not wrapping their arms around the legs of God and asking for forgiveness and mercy. They're, they're developing this different kind of attitude, this presumptuous attitude that thinks they can get away with moving forward. But they will soon find out that whether in blessing or judgment, there is no substitute for faith in God. If you don't get anything else that I say for the rest of the night, that is the lesson of this final segment of judgment. There is no substitute for faith in God. Why? Because what he says goes. Amen. Please don't let me reread verse 26 for 39, but I hope you pick that out. What God says goes. The discipline was coming. Now because of Moses, as harsh as this sounds like, and boy, it's harsh, I mean, there's some, there's some serious things. Well, let's look at some of the judgment. The nation would wander for 38 more years. They've already been wandering for two. 38 more years, making 40 total, one for each day, the spies that explored the land. I mean, that's no, that's no little thing. When God says, I sent, I sent you into the land to spy it out, and you came back with a complaining report after 40 days of seeing the grapes of Eshkol and, and seeing the, the land flowing with milk and honey, you're going to complain? All right, let's, let's make the punishment fit the crime. A year for every day. Oh, I mean, just hearing that, you're like, no! <laughs> you know, it's like, no, daddy, no! You know, I, not that! Oh, but it's coming, but you're, you're missing the blessing of this. They're alive. <laughs> They're not dead. And they could be, they should be looking at the judgment of God actually as veiled mercy because they got it, but it's there. Why? Because, well, what God says he does. And not only that, during that time wandering in the wilderness, every one of the murmuring generation would die. That's the second punishment. Not only would they have to wander, but every one of the murmuring generation would die except for two. Caleb and Joshua. And of course, Aaron and Moses. Of course, Moses wouldn't make it to the promised land anyway. But everyone would have to die. They said, it would be better for us to die in the wilderness. And so God said, all right. And they said, that, 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 this land is going to eat up our women and children. And God said, okay, let's have a little play uh, on your fate here. Your children will take the land and you'll die. And then came the final command. And by the way, the leaders who led you to murmur, they're dead right now. And a plague struck, and the ten spies died. Seems to me like there's no substitute for faith in God, because God does what he says. You might as well just <laughs> demonstrate faith in God, because he does what he says. But it's what happens next that really brings this text to light and lands the point that we try to make. And that is this. <clears throat> this is why there's no substitute for faith in God. Secondly, because without him, we can do nothing. Yes, he does what he says. But here's the part they're about to test. They're about to see if it's possible to move forward without God. Read with me the last five verses. 
Verse 40. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here. Okay, so we're here already. <laughs> and we'll go up into the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. Oh, it's about time. It's about time he's realized that. And Moses said, Wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord? See, there's no faith in God's judgment. But it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies, for the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and, sh and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up into the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. And the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill and smote them and discomforted them even unto Hormah. Here's why, here is why there's no substitute for faith in God. Because without him, you can do nothing. This passage of scripture begins in verse 39. It says that they mourned greatly. Yeah, the, ch the children of Israel may have mourned greatly and said, we have sinned in verse 40. But this mourning was regret and not true repentance. They, were re they, they regretted that God caught them with their hand in the cookie jar, but they were not repentant. This is not mourning for, for true acknowledging of their sin. They were not repentant. Israel had rebelled against God and robbed him of glory. Yet they exhibited no brokenness of spirit or sorrow of sin. Unlike Moses and Aaron, they did not fall on their faces and seek the Lord's help. Do you remember Moses and Aaron and Caleb and Joshua? They rent their clothes. They fell before God, seeking his forgiveness for a rebellious people when they decided not to go in the land. But here they mourned. They say we have sinned, but there's no contrition. It's just stubborn rebellion. And out of that comes, in verse 44, a word called presumed, presumptuousness. They had a presumptuous attitude. What happened was they mistook the, serious, uh, the seriousness of God's judgment for something amendable to change if they will only do what was originally commanded. They thought, okay... I know God offered judgment, but maybe if I do what's right now, then I can get out of it. I can't help it. I'm a dad. I think of, I think of parenting. It just, it's just the parallels are unmistakable. When dad says, okay, get this done, whatever the thing may be, clean your rooms before I get home. What happens if you don't clean your rooms before I get home? Then we're grounded. Okay, does everybody understand that? All right. Okay. Mom and I will be back shortly. Clean your room. You leave. You step back in the house. You know, you know the rest of the story. I don't even, you don't even have to be in my home. You know the rest of the story. You open the door and their eyes become like saucers and they're just like running as fast as they can. Picking up as quick as, oh yeah, we're doing it now. We're doing it now. But it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. But something goes through a, a, a brain of an of a undeveloped child that thinks, maybe if I obey now, then I can escape the punishment that dad said will absolutely come. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and that's what they're doing. No, no, they said it in verse 40. It's like, well, we're here. Okay, we're here. Let's just go ahead and do this now. We, God said to do it. We sinned. We'll do it now. And they, they looked at the judgment of God as this immense amendable thing that, you know, if we, if we just obey now, it'll work out. No respect for the command of God. <clears throat> and so what follows, sin begets sin, and the old sin of unbelieving despair led to the new sin of presumptuous self-confidence. And so they march forward, march forward into battle, into a presumptuous battle. Neither Moses nor the ark left the camp, <clears throat> they, the cloud didn't move from the tabernacle and the trumpets didn't blow. Nobody said go and the battle went forward and they left. They left. And Moses is like, don't do this. Don't go without God. And they went anyway. I, I mean, this is not making sense. 
But they presumed. And then we see what happened. You know what that word presume means? It's interesting. <clears throat> that the word translated presumed in 44 comes from a Hebrew word that means to be lifted up, to be proud, arrogant, and swelled up with one's own importance. Pride. Presumptuous pride. The soldier's battle cry was, we can do it. And God's response was, I won't go with you. And they went anyway. They fought a battle without the Lord. And the results were inevitable. What were they thinking? At the hands of the Amalekites and the Canaanites, the first battle was lost and people died. And they ran for their lives all the way to Hormah. Do you know how far Hormah is? It's a hundred miles the, the irony that they complained about a three-day journey that was 40 miles long, but they turned their back on God and had to run in one day 100 miles to save their life. They got, they got whooped. They got whooped by the Amalekites and the Canaanites that we'll find out later weren't all that strong. But you know what? There's a lesson to be learned, and that is without God... You can do nothing. You can do nothing. <clears throat> An important lesson had to be learned that day. If God is for us, we can, uh, who can stand against us? But if God is against us, there's no hope. There's no hope. With God against you, even the feeblest of foes would triumph. Do you know the children of Israel did learn that lesson? <clears throat> they developed a psalm to sing to their children to remind them of the foolishness of presuming to walk without God. Psalm 95. Psalm 95 It has been often quoted amongst Jewish culture. And instead of reading the whole chapter, I'll read verses 7 through 11. It says, For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture. And the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. And as, uh, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, <clears throat> proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart. And they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. This, this psalm had the, 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 the underpinnings of a lesson they had to learn in the wilderness. Today, if you'll hear, hear his voice, harden not your heart, because you can do nothing without God. You can do nothing. They might not have known that going into it, they might not have understood their relationship with God. Maybe they were feeling their own strength. They'd eat their Wheaties that morning and it's like, you know, today's a new day. Yesterday we saw this, in this land and we thought we could take it or we can't take it. But today, you know, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling pretty good. And they're misunderstanding their relationship with God because the lesson is clear. Without me, you can do nothing. That's the, that's the only lesson of the text. But how does that help us get through our wilderness journey? Here we are. It's 2023. How does this apply to you and me? You know, judging by the way <clears throat> things appear, one might assume the world merely has it hard without God, but we have it better. It's not, it's not a, a wrong assumption. We do have it better, no doubt. But uh, hear me out. Judging by the way things appear, the way things operate in this world, one might arrive at the assumption that the world has it hard without God, but we have it better. By such an assessment, one might arrive at the conclusion that God serves as an aid for our lives. As if without Him, life will be hard but doable. God is more than just an aid for life. He is life itself. 
And the only way a lost world, listen, can feign to live independently of him is by his long-suffering mercy. Do you understand what I mean by this? Judging by the way things operate, there are people who go through life that have no regard for God at all. You know them. They're your neighbors, right? <clears throat> there are people who go through life that, have, that don't appear to have any regard for God. And by judging what we see, sometimes Christians can come to this false conclusion. Well, life without God is clearly harder and we have it better. And if we tried to live that way, boy, it would be sure harder, but doable. That's the wrong conclusion. Do you know why the wicked can live independently of God in their wickedness and still make it through life? Because God's merciful and long-suffering. Because He keeps their heart beating and keeps breath in their lungs and provides food for their table. He still reigns on the just and the unjust. Don't mistake don't mistake the mercy of God upon everyone for the weakness of God to do more than simply aid your life. He is not an aid to life. He is life itself. And without Him, we can do, say it with me, nothing. 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 It's one thing, though, for the lost world to look and appear as if they're living without God. <clears throat> or, 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 or let me say it this way. The lost world feigning to live independently of Him. It's one thing for the lost world to feign to live independently. They feign it because they don't actually live independently of God. But for the people of God to attempt to live independently of God is to willingly sin against the knowledge of God. Because we know better. We know better. The entire experience at Kadesh Barnea teaches us that there is simply no substitute for faith. As Jesus said in John 15, 5, without me, ye can do nothing. Nothing. Every head bowed. Every eye closed.